welcome to the podcast. My name is Blair Sinta. This is Recording Drums. Today I'm talking to my old friend Rich Redmond. Uh, Rich and I went to North Texas at the same time back in the early 90s, so we've known each other a very long time. Um, it was a long period where uh, we had no, no contact, really, just, you know, living in different cities, doing our own thing. And during that time, he rose to the heights of uh, being a seriously well-known player, um, speaker, and, uh, you know, he's had this gig with Jason Aldean for 20 years, and Jason Aldean is a massive Nashville superstar. So uh, Rich has really done some amazing things. He's gotten into public speaking, motivational speaking, um, records. He has tons of credits uh, to his name of records he's he's uh, played on, played percussion on. Um, he, he's a really well-rounded drummer. Um, most people see him as, you know, this kind of heavy-hitting, high-energetic pop rock drummer. Um, but he's got he's got a lot of a lot of uh, facets behind uh, other things that he can do. Um, so we had a, a pretty entertaining conversation, as Rich always is. Um, he's a fun dude. Uh, okay, what else? All right, as always, my courses are for sale. Uh, the Snare Sound Bible, Improve Your Groove, and uh, what's the other one? Oh, Introduction to Recording, right. And also, if you listen to this podcast and you're curious about recording, I give lessons over Zoom, or sometimes I do house calls. I did a house call earlier this week. I went to a drummer's uh, spot in LA, and we listened around his room. We moved some mics around. We talked about the room in general, um, worked on some improvements, uh, and it was a pretty cool... We spent two hours doing that, and I, th I think he walked away with some some improvements. So, uh, I'm available for that. Um, give lessons over zoom, all kinds of things like that. Um, all right. Yep. That stuff's available on my website, the courses and things like that. Please rate the podcast. Please share it on social media. Uh, that really helps subscribe. If you're watching it on YouTube, share it on YouTube, whatever just helps spread the word. Um, uh, again, I, I say this every week. It seems uh, the longer the podcast goes on, which is you know technically not that long, but people are starting to discover it, and it's it's very helpful to other drummers and engineers uh, in this world. So yeah, share it, send it around. All right, let's get to Rich. Take care. Bye. So this yeah. is your studio that I haven't seen. Yeah, man. This is uh, this is you know I call it Crash Studio in Nashville, and it's all right. Um, you know, I'm looking I you know, most people, you know, I've been to your place, beautiful Glendale. Um, this is, I would say it's a, you know, a man cave above a garage in <laughs> suburban Nashville. So I'm looking at maybe like, I think it's probably like 500 square feet, you know, a nice shape. I got all the nice cool patio lights hung. I record my podcast here. Okay. Uh, like you, you know, I've got the workhorse drums. I've got some wide open DW bass drums. I got a vintage Ludwig. 74 kind of quasi Ringo finish. I got a bebop kit. I got some Vista lights. I got some recording customs. And then behind me, you know, you could do everything we need to do probably on an Acrylite, but it's so nice. You go like, okay, I've got some wood sonars. I got some vintage drums I picked up at the Hollywood drum show. I've got some old Kent drums that my God rest his soul, my first college professor, Alan Shin. He gifted to me, and he signed them for me, which is really oh, shit. Strange. Is that a Kent right yeah, in the center? The one below right that? Here. No, no, no. How about the one in the center? The oh, this guy here. It's yeah, a Kent. It is okay. Yeah, and it's 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 great for that R and B thump, you know. Yep. And it's got that original head on a Remo Weather King. I got a drum dot on there, and I've got this, uh, you know, the Drum Paradise pattern here with the with the gaff tape. That's that's the same one I have. Yeah. And then, you know, you pick up some some pioneers and you got the old Rogers and you got to have the Acrylite with the drum taco on it. You got to have some modern DWs with the with Russ Miller's little cross stick. Uh, groove oh, there you go. Thing. And you got to have all your, you know, your BF big fat snare drum covers. And and um, dude, have you tried the carbon fiber snare? Um, The DW? Yeah. Is that the pie drum? Well, they do make a pie version, but there's like a five and a six and a half too. No, I I, I need to check that out. It's pretty You know, it's so funny, you know, being DW guys, and it's like you're on the roster for a long time, and 
you have the guy's cell phones number. You don't want to like wear it out. Like, Hey man, can I get a new mood mic? You know, it's like you try to use the proper channels and you know, I, so I'm getting a brand new kit this year. I'm so excited. Like, cool. I don't know. I don't know what version, because I have a, several beautiful recording kits. Yeah. One of which is, you know, we know Louie hand painting. I've got a beautiful um, black and red sparkle fade maple mahogany that he hand painted. Wow. I mean, just gorgeous. Wow. So that's my main like, music row kit that's in cartage um and then here what i have at the studio is uh this performance kit i don't know about you but i think i just think these performance drums for the bang for the buck they're so articulate they're so loud yeah. um i so haven't I've got, played i haven't actually played those they're played. just really incredible and if somebody wants like a pro kit like you know two grand you know you're in and you're you're in like flint and the stuff it just sounds uh, amazing. Um, and then on the road, the most sexy finish I have ever had on a drum set is this, is that black matte Darth Vader finish. Oh yeah. So I've had that for about, I mean, COVID slowed us down, but I think I've had it for like four and a half years. So this year I'm taking out just a classic backline kit because every backline, we would get these backline kits and I'm like, that is just so simple and so elegant. Piano black. So I'm doing all piano black this year. Nice. And, and um, hopefully we go into rehearsals Tuesday. So we're hoping they arrive. You know, that feeling like, oh, my God, I hope they arrive. If not, we have to wait till next year to use I, them, you know. I had a funny thing with that. With a, I had an AOT kit show up right at rehearsals. And uh, there were some funny issues with it. And the sound, the sound guys were kind of laughing at me. Like when I showed up, they're like, it looks like a bird shit on your kit, man. <laughs> like... I don't want to, you know, I'm not bagging because those were amazing sounding drums, but there was, there was like comedy happening when I arrived and I was like, well, did, <laughs> did you, um, did you keep, have you kept all the kits that you've uh, gotten over the years? No, ago? you know, I, I sold that a main AOT kit I had with Alanis and I regret it because yeah. it sounded amazing, especially the snare. I yeah. really regret it, but it's gone. Well, yeah, you know, and I think that's the case. It's just like, don't get rid of it. Cause it's like, I I've had every size Rototom and eventually you're just like, well, I'm not using those. And you get rid of them. Next thing you know, you know, you're, I'm playing in a nerd rock band and they want all rot Rototoms, you know, or he's like, we're doing a, a Basio tribute and we, <laughs> you know, and then you don't have your Rototom. So they got, you know, don't sell anything. But I was, a, I was a sonar guy for about a decade. And then, you oh, know, yeah. I made the hard, you know, I made the hard choice. It was like, well, I think they got their advertising out of me. I mean, these drums have been everywhere. They've been on a lot of records, a lot of TV shows. And so I let them go and I used that money to um, film my drumming education product. And right. and you've done such a great job with that. Uh, I think you have the snare drum Bible and you have recording. Dr I mean, I have all the, I think I have a lot of those, man. They're great. Ding. Yeah, Thank man. You. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> yeah, it's it's nice when that money just shows up in PayPal, you know. It, it, it certainly does. It certainly does. <laughs> So, all right. So did you move, you moved to Nashville in 97. Is that right? Yeah. Um, March of 97, me and Jim Riley, our friend, Jim Riley. Oh, Riley. Oh, it's crazy. Well, you yeah. got a similar trajectory. And we didn't know, we didn't know that, you know, cause Jim had after graduation, he kicked around Dallas. Like we all do a little bit. Yeah. I don't know how long you hung out. Um, I, didn't, I didn't hang out at all. <laughs> you were just out. You're like, I know what I want to do. I know Two weeks where I later, dude, I was in L.A. Yep. They're good for you. Good for you. <laughs> um, so I was, you know, I always wanted to play in that band Random Axis. It was yeah. just a goal of mine. So, you know, our, one of our heroes, you know, Wojciechowski, I think he's like five years older than me, maybe seven years older than yep. you. And I would always go watch him all the time. I was like, but that is a, that is a great training ground. I could save, save a little bit of money, work with sequences and samplers every night. So I'm glad I did that. But um, you know, Jim had moved to Kansas City and we didn't discuss like, hey, what's your what's your next career path? What are you going to do? And we just showed up in Nashville the same week and went to this jam open mic jam oh, session. Yeah. And he's like, I moved here. And I was like, well, I need a roommate. I can't afford my place. And he goes, well, I need a roommate, too. And we moved in together. It was oh, crazy. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. That's a lot of energy in that house, man. It was, uh, well, yeah, he had his dog, he had, his dog had injured itself, it had that cone around its neck, you know, and I had my cat, Cha-Cha, and they would be going at each other, and I was, I was like, chasing anything I could, and Jim was like, he was determined to just go down to Lower Broadway every night, and, you know, basically advertise his skills, you know, look, I know every country song ever, right. and he would go down there and do the thing, he got snagged re really quick by this guy named Mark Chestnut, Mm -hmm. Took a little longer for me. I had to kick around. I went. I did USO tours. 
I played with a, like maybe juggling five or six different artists that were on the verge of making it and they never made right. it. You know, I think we have similar stories there where it's like, you know, you invest that sweat equity into someone hoping that that record deal is going to pop, that the single's actually going to come out. Yeah. If the single comes out, it actually does something. Um, it's not for the faint of heart, this business, man. Right. You know, I heard, <laughs> so tell me if this is true. I heard that in your early recording sessions in Nashville, you were playing percussion on stuff. Is that, yes. that kind of a, a foot in the door? Um, I I don't remember if the if percussion was coming first or it, drums. Well, were just coming. tell me if I you know I don't want, I'm not is that correct? But but no, I still to this day do a lot of uh, percussion. Right. There's a guy in town named Eric Darkin who would be okay. great for your podcast. Okay. But he does a lot of um, you know he does a lot of TV and film and gospel records and pop and you know uh, country pop records. And um, so he's doing, he's getting a lot of those big calls, but, you know, just being able to double, you know, you get invited as a percussionist and they find out you play drums. It's a great thing. You get, you go to play drums and they find out, oh my God, this guy's got great sounding tambourines and maracas. He can lock with his own track. He can lock with other guys' things. And then the big thing also in, you know, Nashville is the, uh, is the, is the songwriter round. So you've got four songwriters on a, on a, monday night and one tells a story about the song and they do the thing and the next person they take a turn they do three or four rounds and sometimes they'll have a percussionist back there so if you can play a little djembe or cajon make the thing you know have different sonic identities and the brushes and the left hand and mm -hmm. it was a really cool to do that and you meet a lot of songwriters right in nashville the whole you know um uh, musical economy is based on the power of three chords and the truth you know and as you know as a songwriter yourself you know, unless you have that, you've got nothing. There is no music business, you know? Right, right, right. So, but it was cool, yeah. But yeah, did so, but did you get hired as a, as a percussionist? Like yes. in the studios? Yeah, okay. yeah. And and what, so was that like you were working with a songwriter doing that shit or, or, or somebody saw you playing percussion in one of these clubs or what was it? Yeah, I mean, maybe it was a thing where I was like doing a club or I was doing a round or I was doing showcases back in the day we did back in the day we right. did so many showcases you know as you know it's like hey kids here's a certain couple hundred bucks in your cartage and here's a hot meal and we're going to pay you to do six songs with this person and pretend like you've been rehearsing with this person your entire life and the whole industry comes out and you got the cigar guys yeah. um and sometimes that would just be on percussion but yeah it could be a songwriter it could be like a publishing house where they would pay for the day and then all the songwriters would come through and right okay you would, you would bring that thing to life other times you're just you know, uh, adding that beautiful uh, shaker, tambourine, maraca, bongo, finger snap, cymbal swell bed right. to a, another drummer's tracks. And because they shoot themselves in the foot, they're like, I don't play percussion. Right. What? Buy some shakers and tambourines and figure out how to do this thing. You know, no, were you did you were you in were you cutting that live when you were doing those with some of the cats? No, it, it was always like a. As a percussionist, it was always, if I was the sole percussionist and it was like broken down acoustic, okay. then it would be me live with the cats. Okay. Uh, but it, most of the time it would be that seasoning. Okay. And that is after the fact, which is great because if it's a union thing, as you know, it's an overdub, which means you make double scale, right. which is, I, I could actually make, I would make more money playing percussion than drums because of the double scale. Oh, wow. Which is great because you know you go into nashville and you do a session uh 10 to 1 right on drums so there's a scale for demo rate there's a scale for a limited pressing there's a there's a low budget recording and then there's a master recording so the master recording you know i'm sure a lot of your listeners uh have heard this from it pays about 360 bucks yeah if for three hours of your time right so but if you're doing an overdub session as a percussionist you make set you make 720. right which is great. And then back in the day, I said, I'm saying that a lot, um, you know, the, go <laughs> the golden, exist anymore. <laughs> the golden era, you know, of your, of your Paul Limes and your Chad Cromwell's and your Greg Morrow's and your yeah. Eddie Bears and your Lonnie Wilson's in the early, in the late nineties, early two thousands, they're doing three double scale sessions a day. So you do the math on that. It's like seven twenty times three, they're making 2,100 bucks before um your union dues and before self-employment taxes but it's still pretty darn good and they're doing that five six days a week now as you know in la same thing you got big recording drummers that are jumping in bunks on the weekend to go play with your 
you know, your Trisha Airwoods or, or you know, one, they've got people that do casinos and festivals. And then during the week they do things or maybe they're playing the Grand Ole Opry and they, they're in the house band of the Grand Ole Opry. And you would never think, oh, my God, that was a triple scale guy back in the day. Right. And now he's working for single scale at the Opry. But it's just you just have to grow, change, evolve. It is, it is what it is. Yeah. Change, change with the times, as you know, you know. Yeah. So when you were doing those sessions so first of all were, were those demo sessions like classic nashville demo sessions or were they just yeah record dates? Did, yeah did a lot of those well i know you've had and you've had guys on like you know jerry Rowe, and yeah you know i i knew jerry when he was just like i mean like, tiny little dude and right. now he's like so much taller than me uh who isn't taller Every, than me? everyone yeah <laughs> <laughs> i just take pride in the fact that knowing that i'm the same height as stallone and and, and Cruz. you know i just hang on to that i mean oh uh, yeah um it's not the it's not the it's not your height that we're talking about here that's no, no no right? no no, no. <laughs> what are we talking about buddy oh my god i don't know you store you took it off course dude i don't know you know i totally did um, <laughs> oh a lot demo of demo sessions. sessions yeah so demo <laughs> sessions you know and 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 everybody starts doing that you know and then uh, so i think if anything that, of that that still kind of exists like jerry does a lot of that miles mcpherson does that you know dennis Ho there's a lot of guys in town that do that. And I did that for like an eight year period where I would do three of those a day oh, where the kit's set up right. at one studio and then you go, there's another kit at the, and then they piggyback the other kit and you could do, I had a great period of time where it was like doing a lot of that. And I think my record was one day I did 21 songs in nine hours. So that's a lot of times hearing the song and then wow. you're, you're getting that first take. So right. you really have to have a, a strong intuition about song structure and what is acceptable and what makes a radio hit. And right. so that was really good. And I don't know, I think right now it's, um, MIDI trigger fingers. It's just singer songwriters with loop packages and MIDI pads. Right. And that, and then that ends up affecting how, and guys play on the low budget records and the master recordings, because these young songwriters get so attached to their programming. Yes. You know, and sometimes it's super static and it's all one velocity. And right. so we, it's again, just changing with the times, but I haven't been doing a lot of demos and right. cause maybe, maybe that doesn't even exist anymore. Cause someone asked me one time, they're like, Hey, what are the loops you use on the Aldine records? I mean, do you program them? Right. I'm like, man, a lot of these high level songwriters, they're like so accomplished and the barrier of entry now to make some good sounding loops is a $1,300 Mac, right? right? So a lot of times they record a pretty cool little loop and and our producer, Michael Knox goes, I like that Redmond. And then boom, it's in our cans and we play on top of it, yeah. you know? And so really is there, are there demos anymore? When I think of a demo, you know, Eric Darkin was telling me, I think of a guy in his bedroom who's like uh, strumming his guitar into his iPhone and his, his kids are screaming in the background. right? That's a demo, but nowadays everything is just so <laughs> right. Home studio, you know, yeah. Home studio, yeah. So when when uh, I would imagine that, you know, well, I guess you're saying that when you did percussion overdubs, you weren't live there doing the demos. But was there like a? There must have been some kind of great learning curve doing those percussion things before you got hired to play kit demos. Just going yeah. like, oh, this is how it. This is how it needs to get done. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, and just just um, you know, it's time is of the essence. It's like right. I, Nashville is like you know, you and I, uh, you have an amazing workflow in your space, and when I spend time in LA and I gotta record a song, I come to your place, and we have this great workflow. You're like, grab the goat drum, that's a cool sounding tambourine. No, I say, grab oh, the goat, grab the goat. You know, and it's like yeah. it's so it's so <laughs> fun working at your place, but just knowing like you know the distance from a mic microphone and like the amount of air that needs to happen to get the the jingles to resonate in the right spot and then you know if i hold it at the at an angle it's going to resonate a certain way if i hold it flat it's going to be more staccato and just ooh, you know and um you know making sonic choices hey that avocado worked that av remo avocado worked great on this kind of a track or if i do the avocado with some like high-end lp shakers that that's a nice combination of two sounds. And I do things like take the, um, the LP black, uh, it's, it's, it's the black double headed yep. shaker with the red rubber. That amazing. Sounds amazing. Yep. It's on 130 Jason Aldean tracks <laughs> buried under the track, you know, cause you hear the track, you're like, Oh, this feels good. And then you tuck that sucker in there and it just gives it this little, 
movement that's unbelievable. So I'll take like three of those and I'll gaff them together and you're like got this yeah. gigantic, you know, just creating things and learning how to quickly um, lock with another drummer's, you know, not even my own track, but I got to learn how to lock with Greg Morrow and Chad Cromwell and Paul Lyme and Eddie Bears. And it's like, if they go to do a fill, you know, these people are human, you know, very few people that I know in this world can like completely bury a click track front to back in three and a half minutes. It's rarefied air. And and not only that, that's awesome to hear when you're young to be able to hear the click with these classic drummers and go, yeah. like, oh, wait a minute. So when they go for the fill, you're like, you pull back a little yeah. bit off yeah. the microphone. Yeah. But you're you, but uh, you're learning that these guys are not perfect, even though yes. they work a shitload and they're amazing at what they do. But it's not, yeah, not like you hear the, robotic thing. No, you hear the track with yeah. with a, with a count off and them playing musically with like a dummy click. Like say there's no loops, it's just a dummy click. It's like a shaker or a bip yeah. doop bip doop, yeah. and you're like, okay, I mean, great. And you take that thing out, and then it's a, a radio smash because it's a right. it's a it's an earwig melody with this great feel. You know, if you were to set a metronome to a lot of the classic recordings we love from the '60s, '70s, and '80s. Yeah, we would be very surprised to see the the, the sway in the BPMs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, um, you got this. You got this like firsthand account to like when you're. Oh, I'm gonna put a shaker on this cat. Would you ask who is on the track usually when you were doing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, you want to learn these things, and also things like as simple as you know doing the Tracy Partridge di 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 gaga di di di. So you know uh, that's a, what every chick singer is gonna smash two and four, right? But a lot of times. That's you're asking for trouble if you're because you're going to flam a little bit with the snare drum. So the best thing to do is to I have like an imaginary accent in my mind and I kind of feel it in the air. And that way the tambourine can blend more and you're more editable, editable um, instead of slamming the backbeat. Sometimes you work with a, like a big rock producer. It's like, no, I want it raw. I want it to flam a little like Mick Jagger. Pick up those maracas. I don't care if they're not all sliced and diced and quantized. I just want that almost like that retro, you know, the blue uh, corduroy energy in there, you know? Right, right. You know? I mean, that's oh. it's just awesome insight, man, to like you know, to be able to take that thing. I mean, you were you were playing percussion in, in lab bands at school, yes? Oh yeah, I played the uh this is uh nerd nerd central, but right. I did um <laughs> I did a percussion in the two o'clock band. Right. I remember and, yeah. and then you and I would be like I was coming out of the five o'clock band and you were and I was doing everything at, at the same I mean what a fruitful period of our life, you know, but I was like I was into everything because I was trying to like be a a bebopper right. and a fusion guy and a big band guy, just like you were. And then at night I was going into town and I had like my trigger attached to my snare drum. And I was working with the drum cat and like had the Yamaha QX3 sequencer. And I'm trying to lock with the hand claps and yeah. program Janet Jackson songs. So it was a, Dallas had a really vibrant music scene. I think it still yeah. kind of does, you know? Yeah. I don't know, but yeah, I, I mean, would hope so. I would imagine with the school there, it just stays, yeah, a vibrant because and, yeah, and plus there's you know there's a lot of money in Dallas, yeah, and there's there's a lot of parties and there's a lot of uh, shindigs and they always want you know the guys in their tuxedos um, to go do the thing and that would that's you know I tell everybody uh, you know I don't know I know you do a little teaching but I say hey get in a wedding band because you have to be able to play music from like bump, 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 bump through, um, you know, Motown. And then you have to play Iggy Azalea and then you have to do the chicken dance and then you have to play brushes and everything in between. You might have to wear charts, play with sequences. Right. You know, it's awesome. Right. You know, for a younger musician to get that under their belt. What was the thing? What was the thing that transitioned you from kind of doing these, these, percussion sessions to people going, Oh, let's get rich to play drums on our yeah. recordings. Well, I think I was kind of doing that all at the same time. It was drums and this guy's band percussion and that guy's band drums and percussion. Well, yeah. Not um, to say that you were only doing percussion. Yeah. 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 But there was obviously something that went like, you know, rich can do both these or, or <laughs> let's get them to. Well, you know, I'm trying to remember specifically what happened. I wish I had saved my, calendar and my journal from 1997 because <laughs> i think i had one of those 
I think I had one of those calendar, like Carmen Electra calendars, you know, where uh -huh. she was wearing a different swimsuit every month. And you would write down like on this Thursday, I'm playing with this band and Friday I'm going to, you know, Japan for two weeks. <laughs> and I wish I had kept that sucker. But, uh, you know, in the beginning, you're just I mean, for the you're pictures, just, you're just good. Yeah. <laughs> You're just grabbing at straws in the early days. Right. You're like, okay, I'm going to do this showcase. I'm right. going to go play down for tips on Lower Broadway. I'm going to, you know, go rehearse with this artist that's on Arista Records. I hope the hope the single comes out. Um, and and right. just for it's like first come first serve. Just and then I was waiting tables and I had a pager and then I would you'd go and you'd be all excited and you put the quarter in the pager be, man the page I had yeah. to pull over on the four hundred five a number of times. Ah, oh, oh. somebody's call, I got to call it back right now. I know. Yeah. Yeah, and it was so exciting when someone's like, "Hey, man, can you come down do four forty-five minute sets for twenty-five bucks and free beer?" And you, and and man, you do it, you know. And then one handshake leads to another, and and then you know people would just see me playing. They're like, "Hey, kid, I like your energy," and and uh, you read number charts. And then I found myself on this on a on a, on a session with these number charts. And you know, our buddy Jim Bradley wrote the yep. book on. So, so for people that you know don't know. Um, you know, number charts are basically numbers that outline the harmonic structure of a song. So uh, session musicians in Nashville need to be able to like transpose quickly between the 12 keys. And as a drummer, you're watching the numbers go by and the specific drum information is on, isn't on there. You have to have a, it's an insane gut instinct mm -hmm. to figure out like what this song needs and then make it happen. So if you don't read written rhythms, it's not a big deal. I know musicians here that have played on 125 number one songs. They don't read Western notation. Right. But I tell everybody, hey, learn how to read the Western notation because as a drummer, you're expected to get the first or second take. So if you can write down a rhythmic figure or kick drum patterns or specific fills, it's going to help you get that take. And then then it's knowledge and people start going, oh, my God, this it, this is the hardest seat in Nashville. Right. And really any city is that the expectation is to play something that's totally radio friendly, stays out of the way of the storytelling, your sounds are great. You're locked with the clicker loop. Boom. Then you're in the um, lounge drinking your coffee while everybody is overdubbed. But if you're not lazy, you know, you pick up a tambourine and a shaker. And you go, let me add this while the other guy's adding his bazooki or the second pass of a, of a high string or whatever. And I would always do that. Even if on demos, if they wouldn't pay me, I would always put that thing. Because to me, the track is not done until the percussion is on there. And I stole that from our friend, Aronoff, who played so many great um, quasi-classical folk percussion passes on Scarecrow, Lonesome Jubilee, right. all those records that to me are like Desert Island records, yeah, like detuning the congas and the bongos and playing those, you know, uh, all right now clave patterns and the two rhythm tech tambourines, you know, the Crystal Talaferro stuff. I learned so much by listening to that stuff. I just stole it, mm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I like it, you know? And, then, you know, we it's just a, it's a learning thing, you know? Uh, um, when I first came to Nashville, I was cracking rim shots. Drums were really high tuned. It was the 90s, right? Yeah. And then as things go along, you you just start to learn to get a little bit more versatile and the, the little, the tuning ranges of your drums and how to quickly alter the sonic identity of one drum or a couple drums and were there, those were, things were there particular to... producers that kind of were like hey hey dude let's can you try this that clued you into that or was that more just kind of in your in, yeah. in the atmosphere of like oh i it's time to, for me to grow up and <laughs> you know, yeah i gotta i gotta drop the pitch on this yeah, exactly on yeah yeah um yeah the, a combination of those things i'm i'm fortunate in the sense that the majority of work that I do in the studio is with the same producer, Mr. Michael Knox, who championed me. You know, he hired us to to do showcases with a young Jason Aldean. That grew into us recording. Right. And yeah. Uh, and so for us, we we recorded this studio called Treasure Isle, which is this really classic studio, 30, 30, 35 foot high ceilings, a lot of wood. And and uh, the engineer that did all those records was a guy named Peter Coleman that did all the Blondie records. He recorded my Sharona, so he did the knack. Oh, yeah. He did all the, he did Myron Grombacher with Pat Benatar, yep. and he's just an old school 
57 on the snare drum, you know, D112, 57s on the toms, yeah. you know, um, Rich, can you play the hi-hat softer? Right. Probably not. So you put the little tape underneath <laughs> the bell of the cymbal. And then I got that hi hat, the hi hat husher coming, man. Did, have you, do you like that thing? I think it's actually, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah I, I can't wait to check it out. I think it's over at the warehouse. I got to pick it up, but yeah, I, you'll, you'll, especially for the, st the style, like if you were back here, stylistically it's going to be great because i've especially i don't work with many nashville people but the ones i do there's always that extra hey man can you get a little more separation and you're like yeah oh, that's really hard you know yeah this thing but, is just bleeding left and right yeah um but you know for that room that we record all those records in it was uh you know it's just if it ain't broke it actually became almost like a sonic identity for aldine which is a five and a half black beauty okay. tuned medium yep. with the high ceilings and the 57 yep. and Pete doesn't mic the bottom of the snare drum. It's totally old school, but he likes to have, I like 40, I like 40 strands and I'll have the forties kind of diagonal. And he likes to have the 57 kind of like right in line with that snare bed. And then he likes me to loosen up the snare. So there's just a, that you can hear from the top mic. Yep. But then maybe I'll go, I remember the phone rang one time and I got to work with Dan Huff. It took me 13 years for the phone to ring. I'm so excited. I go, Dan, what took you so long? I've been in Nashville for 13 years. And so, so we go and you know, the, we're, at, we're at Blackbird and I got my drums, all oh, my sonar drums and all my snare drums and my bags of cymbals and them. It was such a luxury because, you know, and he's got the drums, top and bottom on the snare, yep. multiple mics on the kick. We had a tunnel, top and bottom mics on the tom toms. Yep. I mean, the deal, yep. you know, high yep. fidelity drums. And and it's no big deal. You just, you got to be able to take that direction. And it's usually what we do with uh, Aldine, we do one song every 90 minutes. So any number one song you hear from Aldine, and and I we can't even pat ourselves on the back. We know what to do to bring the song to life. But the reason it's so easy is because the songs are well, con so well constructed and so well written because we're yep. in the songwriting capital of the world. Yep. So 90 minutes, I've never done more than three takes of a song. Usually it's the first or second, usually the second, because we use the first to make sure that we like the tempo, we like the sounds, the arrangement is in place, come up with an ending. And, um, and uh but for the dan huff session we had three hours per song which was like oh my god we can experiment with snare drums yeah. mic placement using program loops uh trying to create a, like a lo-fi thing using acoustic drums yeah. um that was a real luxury at the same time three hours can be too much because sometimes you come right around to the first idea you had yeah. but but it's it's, it's a it's, it's a okay luxury. also but yeah yeah i mean yeah sometimes that way you know you you doubly know yeah and that's why drum, some drum demo musicians you know and there's not there's that line that is not in the sand anymore like nashville in the 90s was like you're a road musician or you're a demo guy or you play on master recordings or you know um now there's like everybody does everything and everybody has to be a master of all right just to just to survive right but I think the demo musicians from back in the day were some of the greatest musicians because you only have 35 minutes per song from hearing it to, yeah. to the finished product. So you totally have to rely on your gut and be able to take direction, but at the same time, be so strong in your concepts and desires and, and musical uh, ideas and just be able to commit in that moment. Do you, do you feel like because of all this recording with Jason that – and, and that that basically that time period that you're kind of used to that yeah. has kind of like strengthened your gut intuition about like what the right thing is. And, you, you know, not to say that yeah. you're not open, but you're kind of like, I'm pretty sure this is the right thing, you know? Yeah, but, totally. I think I think that, you know, it's it's uh, it's time in the trenches, you know, it's a, you know, those 10,000 hours. So God knows how many thousands about tens of thousands of hours you and I have not only from working on the craft, but applying the craft and 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 all the things we learn about don't go to we know nowadays that stylistically very rare for you to tang the hump mm -hmm. ging ging you know like mickey curry in the 90s mm -hmm. you're probably going to be tipping or shanking on some sort of a more washy ride symbol and 
little tiny 10 inch toms that scream fusion are not usually going to be in cool singer songwriter retro indie things right and and that generally a higher pitch snare drum is going to be less of a choice than a mid to low gushy thing right you know? and bigger darker hats are more in um in style now so we just kind of know where to go initially and then just from studying what gets on the radio and what elicits smiles and a positive body language from engineers producers songwriters and fellow band members you know to skip all the searching things because you know what is gonna work okay gotcha and, and just get and you know we you and i did uh some country s tracks yep. at your place yep and they have a kind of an idea of what they want they might reference an artist or a track mm -hmm. and then they have a, a pretty much fully realized demo and then you say okay so now i just have to execute that as a human being mm -hmm. tight with the click make it feel great make all the tones and that's that green light is hitting that thing the same way every time right and and then hopefully having um five at least five percent of your personality in there that makes it completely <laughs> unique you know percent <laughs> yeah i mean because everyone's so committed to and tied to the demo but for some reason you know they could just hold on to the program drums and release the track i mean it's happened many times before but for some reason they're reaching out to you and willing to pay your rate to have your soul your heart your humanity on there yeah so so thank god i hope that never goes away you know yeah. yeah so one of the things that like when i recorded you for the first time out here and listen to the whole statement before i finish <laughs> um, i was i was surprised at how loud you played but i will tell you because they were my drums and i know this room i was first of all i was like oh my god he hits hard in the studio <laughs> but I also know that I was like, "Wow, you're getting a completely different sound out of the out of my drums that than I get," and uh, it was dynamically like so even, and yet you you played the cymbals great, you know what I mean? And like those were dynamically correct, but I, it really took me off guard for a second. I was like, wow. "Holy shit!" But it sounds freaking great, and you get a different punch out of the drums than than I do. And that's, I mean, that's pretty cool, but I was, you know, I guess that's just part of, it's just part of your thing. You hit way harder in the studio than I do and it yeah. works. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. Well, I, man, I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, people say, is there a difference in the mindset between a studio musician and a live musician? And I just say, you know, uh, play drums, collect check, but no, it's really, it's really like, you know, you want everything to be even, you want the limbs to be balanced. Sometimes the, I will hear like, Hey, you know, you want to pull back. I do get that pull back on the symbols, but at the same time, when you go check out, you know, Taylor Hawkins, Dave Grohl, they're, they're freaking smacking the symbols, man. You know what I mean? But they're also yeah. smacking the drums. Right. So I'm going, you know, I, I think I'm an overeducated rock drummer. I think that, that, you know, my modus operandi is, is I'm a knuckle dragging rock drummer that knows how to read music and play other styles of music. Right. Um, but, uh, but I, I have enough, uh musical intuition and flexibility to know oh let's use smaller darker symbols or let's play softer you know but for those tracks that i got hired for it was yep. it was kind of like pop country so they want those transients bam and you know i heard the fin i heard the finished product and i was like this is good i don't think they added you know samples in the mix but you know how often is it that um we are happy with the song, the vocal, the drum sound, the other musicians, and the finished mix. It's yeah. so rare that yeah. you're happy with everything. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and also, you know, I have a um I have a desire, like I have like a soft spot for singer songwriters. Like I love the Lucinda Williamses and the Dave and the Damian Rices and the um, you know, the Steve Earls and the Chris Stapleton's, I love a gushy snare drum and you play being able to play with the tip of the stick and, you know, thuddy toms and, and pulling a, a felt beater off the head and darker cymbals. I love that. And I'm hoping one day I can do that live or on tour or something. 
Um, it's just that I'm not, you become a character. You know, it's like I'm a character actor. They're like, oh, get that guy that does the detective in every movie. And that's <laughs> that's my drumming. And they're like, let's get let's get ready. So nine times out of ten, they want me to. I've got my black sheep wood beater. Yep. I'm cracking a shot. I got larger symbols, thuddy toms and shanking away on the stick and that's what people want me to do mm -hmm. other day someone sent me something that had strings on it and i put the um tea towels on the drums and i had the wire brushes i overdubbed a nice shaker and some orchestral cymbal swells and it was like um perfect and but you know a lot of people don't see me doing that I they see me right. on youtube doing yeah yeah you know, yeah i understand you know. totally man yeah so what are you gonna say okay. no i don't want your money you know, I, I don't want to play on your project. I don't want your money because I have to do the same thing over and over. Ah, you do the same thing over and over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, look, dude, I, you have a thing and it works. And, you know, this has been your that's been your bread and butter for a long time now. So that, you know, and Thank God and, uh, you know, just to reiterate what I'm saying to you, what I said to you is is not an insult at all. I was. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was just like a, a, a an observation of like you know, wow. And here, yeah. here's the thing. I also know, because I've known you for a long time, that you have many palettes, right? Yeah. So. You know more than other people, then, because we have that history together. Um, but now, did you find that I played louder than a lot of guys you've recorded in your space? Oh, yeah. Oh, the wow. loudest, for sure. So are there but, guys but, that but, literally... But here's they're, the thing. I also know that in my room, symbols are tough because the room is small. So I know that those get out of control fast and that didn't happen with you. Great, great. So that was that, you know, my awareness of like, oh man, the drums are pumping, like they're pumping, but the symbols are not like, yeah. this is not a, a problem. It never was, you yeah. know what I mean? Well, good. Yeah. Cause I know that's my thing. Cause I'll, you know, I love the internet trolls. You know, you, you, you make a point to like <laughs> put your, um, you know, you put your, your videos on the internet and you're like, hey, man, there's no better way to like to let the world know, like, hey, this is how I yeah. sound playing the drums because there's a yeah. camera that's five feet behind me. Yeah. And um, and and guys will be like, oh, those poor symbols. And I'm just like, it's the same if you're going to see a, a like a, a Dave Grohl play the drums. It's, it's like, you know, Nate on the on the voice. He's got those beautiful glancing blows, but they're large symbols and they're balancing the kit and. But I do know that that could be my Achilles heel where I have to be conscious in the studio not to ignite the overheads too much. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's an awareness factor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have two questions and I just, they both just flew out of my mind. Um, are you engineering <laughs> at all in your room or do you, or do you bring somebody in to do that? You know, as somebody that's a chronic overachiever um, and, you know, a motivator, <laughs> I need to mo my, motivate myself, but, I just took a look at things, you know, and, and I think a lot of people will say, oh, like a career model for me was, you know, and it's probably similar to you, was definitely a Kenny Aronoff where you can have your drums in Europe and Asia and L.A. and New Jersey and Nashville and you're flying around, you're playing live and you're playing. I was like, oh, my God, I want to do that. Um, but what was the question, buddy? I, I get totally yeah, about engineering, that. engineering. Oh, yeah, engineering. Yeah. So so just kind of looking at like, all right, I've got so many different things that I do and so many things on my plate. If I'm home in Nashville on a Monday and I've only got 36 hours in town, I got to do laundry, kiss the cat, um, get some sleep, and then knock out 10 tracks. My drum tech is my engineer. He's got my same exact um, schedule as I do. So I say, Johnny, come over on Monday. I'm going to buy you lunch. We're going to have a pot of coffee. We're going to knock out these 10 tracks. He makes a beautiful day rate. I satisfy the client, get the job done. Me trying to do Pro Tools and file management on 10 tracks, it ain't gonna happen, right? So I'd rather give part of my um, my 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 money away and have somebody that's got a 50,000 foot overview of my sound, knows how I play drums and is a great engineer. And now Johnny also, his goal was to make himself indispensable. He just turned 31, and this is closest as I come to having a son. I hired this kid when he was 19 <laughs> years old. Oh, shit. He is now 31 years old. Steely Dan wants him. Elton John wants him. But he knows I'm going to make a check every two weeks. 
if I stay here and it's been 12 years, right? But the fact is, is that he's so great at what he does. The phone is ringing left and right for this kid. And we just do this stuff together. He knows how I play. Oh, and so he wants to make himself an asset to any organization. So his engineering ability, now he's behind me, three feet behind me. He's watching me, making sure that if he's got to pull off a crack symbol or adjust a microphone, but he's back there. Do not pay attention to the man behind the curtain running Pro Tools now. Mm -hmm. So he's running our entire show back there. Two Pro Tool systems run talking together. He's firing off all the tracks and keeping an eye on me all night long. Wow, man. But he's got me so dialed in that the only thing he really does, he comes up, he goes, everything all right? Hands me another cold water, a cold towel, <laughs> checks my snare drum, tweaks the, you know, the throw off a little bit. Yep. And is like, I'm like, dude, everything's great. And he's like, awesome. Goes back, is running Pro Tools. So, so was he, when do you met him at 19? Was he engineering also, or was that something that he's like, Oh, I'm going to get into this to, to. He's from Chillicothe, Ohio. His name is John Hull, H U L L great kid. Okay. And he got a two year degree in music production, commercial music production. So he was already way into pro tools and loops and, and, um, uh, I movie. And, you know, like when I have to do like, uh, motivational speeches here, He's got the lighting. He hooks the lapel mic. He's running the oh, camera. Oh, shit. You, take, you literally take him to everything you do. I'm And he books, he manages all of my clinics. And, wow. Uh, wow. I know. Really? I know. We have a, it's amazing. It's an wow. amazing thing. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So he'll, he's a 10 percenter is what he is. You know, he's, uh, he, he's like, you know, he, he handles all the stuff for me and makes his 10 percent of my fee. Yeah. Um, for clinics and stuff. And then I pay him a, a per song rate here in the studio, okay. you know? Um, Did he help you pick up microphones and everything for the studio? You no, know, it's really funny. Um, everything needs an upgrade. So like I'm an audio technical artist. So I think like maybe like 12 years ago, like this is not the ultimate Tom mic, right? I mean, it's a workhorse, it'll work, mm -hmm. but I need, I want to upgrade all of my microphones and I need a, you know, I'll probably do the, um, What's the 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 box that everybody uses that everything just renders right away? It's got all the pre's built into it. The, the universal audio? Yeah, I'll probably just do that. You know what I mean? It's like because right now I've got like a black line audio modded okay. Digio three and a light pipe. <laughs> I mean, this is dated technology, yeah. right? Yeah. But that's why I don't list my gear on my website because I don't want some you know client to go like, oh, where's all the Mojave and where's all the uh, outboard gear? This is. Like, you know, this is a huge part of your revenue stream. This is a smaller part of my revenue stream. So, but, you know, if I get one of those cool FU checks at the end of the year from like SAG or AFM, I'll probably just go and I'll buy a bunch of, you know, pre's and I'll finally do that thing and upgrade the microphones. But for right now, I send people the files and they're like, they hear the sweat, they yeah. hear the passion, yeah. they hear a clean signal. Yeah. If they want to add samples, they can. No one has ever complained about my gear. Yeah. Well, go know? talk. Go go talk to Miles McPherson because he's totally on all digital pre's. Yeah. Everything. He like fully went for it, and and he told me that he sold all his outboard gear. Yeah. To go that route, and I was like, okay, cool. I mean, yeah. I mean, Miles has always kind of been. Um, I always, I tried to, I tried to get, uh, teach Miles how to read the third page 38 of the syncopation book, like 25 years ago. And I don't, he was not interested at the time. And then he moved to LA and, and just got a bunch of tattoos and rocked out. And now he's back playing country music. It's like so crazy. Cause he's right. from here. Right. Kind of like, I think Aaron Thurling is from here and right. he moved back here. Right. So Nashville is, just, it's such a crazy place. And it is so grown up. You Jerry, know? I mean, we, Jerry moved out here too for a while. And Jerry went out there and did the Los Feliz thing. And everybody has the pull of Southern California. I mean, I was by coastal for seven years. I still got my drums over at Angel City. Thank you. Thanks to you. But I'm just kind of taking a, a break from that grind because I had two places, two cars, two sets of car insurance, two it was a lot. Yeah, man. It was a, it was a, it was a lot, but I love the culture of Southern California where you can go to a strip mall. And you can get Indian, Ethiopian, Thai, vegan, and junk food in the same strip mall. 
that does not exist in Nashville. It just doesn't. But we have valet parking finally. We have sushi finally. And they can finally make a good martini here. I mean, it is it is a city. It is and everyone's coming here, which is which is great for our housing prices. And you know, you already have like, you know, Doombex and Maracas in your studio. So why do you need that stuff? You know, <laughs> right. you have the culture right there, man. It's all good. It's all right here. So no, and you know, and I'd, I'd like to get more work. You know, I, I, you know, I know that a lot of guys are listed on these um, virtual recording sites for other musicians, and I, I know they all exist. Some people have limited different results on that, but I, most of my work literally comes through my website. Uh, or Facebook or Instagram. It's like someone's just going to slide right into your DM and be like, hey, I'm a producer in Canada and I, I've got this artist and we want to do four songs and we want to get it done before the end of the month. And you're like, great, how's the 20th? And right. it's it's crazy. Are you are you doing film or anything like that out there? Film, TV, anything like... I would so want to, you know, because I'm so tied into that. I mean, starting with Jerry Goldsmith, 1979, Alien. I'm like, how can I... That's like a secret fantasy of mine is I would love to find myself on some LA scoring sessions playing the, a multi percussion, you know, cause there's such specialists out there you got the temp guy, yeah. got the mallet guy, and then you got the guy that does the Latin stuff. And then there's the sounds guys. That would be so fun. But I remember talking to Chad Cromwell, like we did the music of Frank Zappa at UNT in 1995. I was the rehearsal drummer. So I prepped the ensemble and then Chad came and I booted me off the drums and I had to go back and play bass drum and tambourine on Strictly Genteel, right? But he was, I was like, how do you do the sound? Do you do the soundtrack thing? He's like, man, it is such a, it's a whole other world. It's like completely different than playing on pop records or doing tours. It's like completely in a, another world. Yeah, yeah. Wait, Chad Cromwell came to UNT in 95? Yeah, he was a guest artist for the 50th anniversary or was it it was um zappa's 50th birthday he had just passed he died so young he he, he died in 91 no 94 okay so then it was 94 94 or nine yeah he decided he well i th it's weird that i remember but he died on december 4th 94 i i only remember that because that's my brother's birthday oh my and god it was just like a weird i was like oh Zappa died today. So I remember, well, I don't know if it was the same year, but it was like, you know, our teacher, you know, Dr. Stroma, anybody knows Doc, he's so forward thinking and the, the ensemble there was right. such a, I mean, he had mics on the players and on the instruments. It was like a true fusion ensemble um, with percussion instruments. And so I got to, you know, rehearse to get the ensemble ready. Got, 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 boom, got, boom, got, the black page. Mm -hmm. And so that was amazing. Um, but then Chad told me, he goes, well, your pianissimo is like way too soft. Cause in, in Frank's band, a pianissimo was more like a mezzo forte because it was a rock band. So right. when he wrote pianissimo, it was more like a mezzo forte. Right. And then a triple forte was like effing loud. Right. So you had to adjust your dynamic pyramid. Right. Thank God we went to school, man. You know, well, because that's like that a, was, that's a, that's a college perspective versus a professional perspective yeah i was like oh my god triple pianissimo yeah. i'm at yeah, the edge yeah. of the snare drum yeah yeah so chad cromwell can rock some zappa oh it was chad wackerman oh okay all right i was like wow <laughs> yeah 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 that makes way more sense man okay yeah wackerman. no but i mean i love it okay yeah, now yeah. that now that rings a bell because was... he was playing with men at work at the time okay you know he was doing the men at work gig and but he was going around to colleges and doing the guest artist thing and and so that was fun, man. You know, you put all these things in our, these feathers in our cap and, you know, um, if you can kick that 17 piece big band and you could read odd times in a percussion ensemble, 99% of the stuff that you're going to be doing playing a Tom Petty song, you know, you have to get into that vibe. It has its own language unto itself, yeah. but it's going to be much more manageable because you did all this other crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, uh, what's your percentage of being in your room right there versus being like out in Nashville playing at, at whatever other studios? Yeah. Thank God I'm more of a music row. And now the new, new music row is a place called Barry Hill. So it's a section of town. That's like a, a lot of houses that have been converted into studios. And that's, what's kind of cool about music row is that you have all these houses that look like they might be like dentist office and, 
and they're but they're like publishing houses and right. recording studios and management companies and the whole business is on four streets so that's why it's so easy to meet people in nashville because the whole industry is kind of like around that part of town whereas like la god bless you i don't know how you did it 25 years ago it's like well i'm trying to go to genghis cohen and then i got to go over the hill and i got to go yeah. so it's harder it's harder yeah, to get around hard. and that was pre pre this right it was like right we had this thing called the thomas guide and you would graph out you're okay. I need to be at a seven, which is somewhere in West Hollywood. And I'm coming from the North Valley and like, okay, yep. I'm going to take these street. Yeah. But now in the iPhone has made it so unbelievable. I got to the point where I didn't really need my, my iPhone directions getting around LA. I was so right. proud of myself. Occasionally I would find myself, Ooh, this does not look good. I need to get out of here. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but most of it, I'm usually in a, in a, in a real studio, but um, and then are there, are there, are there like house drums at most places now? There's some house drums and they're, they're usually not maintained all that well. You know, when I moved to town in 97, I was lucky in 98, I took a studio drumming class with a gentleman named Tommy Wells. God rest his soul. Okay. He did a lot of, um, he did a lot of sound alikes like k -tel stuff and like karaoke tracks where you would have to copy the exact track. Really? Um, yeah, and it was so cool when he would call me. He'd be like, hey, you know that number one song you played on? I had to recreate it today. And I was like, oh, my God, my mentor is doing karaoke tracks of songs that I played wow. on. And there was also this other guy named Jerry Croon that um, that was a recording guy in the 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. And they would say, like, okay, um, here's a pearl export. And the heads would be ancient, pitted pinstripes and they would detune everything and, and there'd be like a squeaky pedal and they'd be like okay what are you going to do you got 30 minutes to make this thing sound good and so they're like okay make sure you have your own wing nuts and felts and that you can bring these and make these and you got your gaff and your lug locks and you got some wd-40 and it was like they would test us and make sure that we could read the number system what? and we could do really? our own charts it was a studio drumming class it was awesome it was That's really cool it. and how, yeah. how long was that like it was like a couple weeks, like, you know, uh, two nights a week, a couple weeks, you know, it was, it was really good. It was a really good thing to do, but that's, uh, you yeah. know, in the first, was that uh, something that like everyone knew about like national drummers, like, Oh, you should do this thing or like, no, they only did it. They only did it for a couple of years. Um, okay. but I'm, I mean, I'm glad I, I like, I caught those guys because soon after that, you know, you know, Tommy passed, God rest his soul and, and Jerry retired. Um, I think for a while he was playing with Don McLean, you know, bye bye American yeah. pie. Mm -hmm. doing that thing um but i just stole from everyone man and i'm still stealing from every you know but but you know to your point of like how often am i in this room well it's just to have this creative space um to be able to i've got all my zoom cameras so i've got an overhead zoom camera i got a foot cam i got a zoom camera in front of me and i got one over my shoulder and then johnny sometimes if i want to do a live master class or he will literally he'll film me and then he's got that i've got that switcher and he could do like a live broadcast between the four yep. cameras and then i got my podcast over there and pre-pandemic i would have like full bands in here like five guys like my friends in the band parmalee you know i, I co-produced their first number one song they'd all come in we sit around like joe rogan and we do the thing and i would film it and now i'm 150 episodes in and i think 80 of the or not more have been on zoom but you know it's not as fun you don't smell the other person's musk you can't have coffee together but you could literally interview anybody on the planet mm -hmm. which is you know as you know is a really cool thing but to have this room like this a collection of percussion from around the world a variety of drum sets a bunch of different snare drums um tons of different symbols i got the lee howard stevens bag filled with every you know head hunters you know, we both play that head under yeah, stuff, yeah. different brushes. And I've got all the, the Sean Pelton things all gaffed and tape. Right. That stuff is all here. Do I use it all the time? No. Sometimes I'm they just cut. They want me to go bing, wah, bing, bing, wah. And then, <laughs> and, and then you do it with a smile on your face. Um, but then there'll be like a month I might go by. And, and I'm so busy on the road that I only have maybe six days in Nashville. And on those six days, I might have to do a motivational speech that i have to prep for and that right. takes up my time or right. i'm i'm right i'm writing a book right now on how to make it in country music um with a real publisher and i've got a real deadline so wow I, i'm fortunate in the sense that i'm never 
hurting for work because I've created enough of a different revenue streams within the drum industry that some it keeps me excited. Sometimes it's more road. Sometimes it's more on Music Row. Sometimes I'm in here several days. Sometimes I'm on the road doing the speeches. Sometimes I'm just in my room working on a book or I might do the Skype lessons. It's just so fun to do these different things and yeah. trying to keep the clinics alive. You know, there's a couple of us that are trying to keep the clinics alive. Yeah. I did that for 13 years without fail. That's a dying art. And now yeah. it's a dying art. And the companies, God bless them, they want to support all their artists. Um, but the, you know, post COVID, the, ah, the businesses have been affected. So the money that you can account on coming from your main sponsors is, isn't there right now. So like guys like, Superman have had to shake up the business model where it's just like, boom, straight cash. I'll do a three hour masterclass for $200 and 20 people sign up and they leave with this cool packet of Todd's warm ups and beats and fills. And they go, Oh my God, that was worth every penny. So now I'm going to that model where I'm doing a two hour masterclass um, for straight cash. Gotcha. You know? Yeah. Is, that is, mostly, cool. is it more or less local? Or are you doing them when you're on the road? You set them up. Do them on, do them on the road, and that's the way to do it. Yeah, yeah. You do them during the day on a Saturday, yeah. or I fly in a day before my band, and I'll do the the local five star drum shop, or I'll stay a day behind from my band, and then and then I'm involved with School of Rock, and there's this new um, one called the Bach to Rock, and then there's another one called Rock Stars of Tomorrow. So there's these three different platforms that are kind of great about getting kids involved in music and. You know, as you know, not all the kids are going to go into music, but they learn so much about time management and persistence and working as part of a team. And yeah. I love being part of that whole thing. So, yeah, you know, the grass is always greener. I would love to have more of that sexy singer songwriter work in this room. But I just go to where the work takes me, man, and just, yeah. you know, try to try to smile and have a great time. Yeah. Well, I think you do. All right, man. Thanks, bud. You do, <laughs> man. Well, dude, thanks. Yeah, man. You know, I wish I, you know, Mike Dawson, I was a guest on his podcast and, you know, his angle is the, is the, um, you know, you were on it is kind of like gear and like how to modify the 20 strand versus the 40 strand or the, the triple flange versus the die cast. Yeah. And, and then your angle is recording. So I, I wish I had more to say, like, this is the exact outboard gear I'm using. These are mics that I'm totally tied to. This is where my room mic is, but I just literally rely on well, other people it, so much. Yeah, to me, it's not about that. It's about how people get it done. And yeah. and, and you're you're the only person I've talked to that has like like a guy. Liter literally a guy. Yeah. So a guy. There's like a, to, there's like a new angle. You know what I mean? Like if you, yeah. if you get a guy, and and if you don't have, a, if you feel like you want to have a strong workflow and you want to. Um, have the body of work and you know be able to turn things over faster then you might have to groom a kid you get a kid from the you know pasadena city college or ucla or whatever he's hungry and now we're we're getting through the covid so if you're comfortable being in the same room with another person yeah. you know um it's a great time to maybe groom that person you know which is i've, I've been trying to train my dog <laughs> especially during covid it's it's not working well, man. Well, you have a great workflow, man. You're just like, you know, your house is right there. You walk past your, you're in a whole another space. You can't hear, like, it's totally yeah. hermetically sealed yeah. and all that. Which yeah. is... Especially when you're over here, man. Wow. And I didn't even, I thought <laughs> I was, be, I thought literally, I thought I, I thought I was being the polite version of myself, but my God, you should hear us play a live show. Oh my God. It's like a jet engine taking off. Come on, man. That was a good, that was a good, that was a good opening, man. <laughs> I mean, amazing. we go way back, dude. Come on. Oh my, so and, and 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 you know, I'm so happy for you, man. I'm so proud of you. So likewise, dude. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. I appreciate your time, dude. Hey, dude. I was really looking forward to this. I was like, hey, I wonder if Blair's ever gonna have me on because I had you on my show, and I was like, you know, I he probably thinks that I'm, you know, I'm not the right guy because of the recording thing. And then as soon as I was thinking that, boom, text message. Come on, man. So thank you, brother. Yeah, man. Yeah, of man. course. So yeah. No, I mean. Look, uh, uh, again, just to, just to re I mean, uh, uh, recording you out here was like a, was like seriously a pleasure because between your sound and your feel, I mean, oh. the, the way you land things is like seriously impressive. 
Oh, well, thanks, man. I mean, <laughs> I like, I've heard it. a few people out here, and everybody's great. But, I mean, you fucking nail the shit out of it fast, and it's it's really impressive. So, oh, man. Thank it's you. it's like, it's it's cool for me to see. Just like, you know, it's kind of similar to what we were talking about at the beginning. You're playing percussion against, so you know, some of the most classic national recording guys and then you know that's how i view it here it's like oh i get oh i i love it when i get to record people because i get to see where they land and their inconsistencies or they're not or the kind of sounds they they decide to go for and you know what i mean yeah choices so you know yeah and and being able to take direction buddy you know like i loved our workflow because i was like hey i think this is could be the drum that we could just keep up all day, you know, the hit maker. And yeah. you're like, let's just take the pitch up just a little bit. Let's just take the pitch down a little bit. Let's add a little muffling. Let's. T- I think we used almost the same drum. We did all day. Yeah, 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 totally. Yep, yep. I still have your Sabian symbol here, by the way. It's it's waiting for you whenever you get. What is it? it? What is it? It's the double X whatever. You want me to grab it? I'll show it to you. Oh, well, yeah. I told you I have it. You were like, dude, ah. dude, use it. I mean, the funny thing is, is that like I when I lend out things. Um, I know I've got some like killer prototypes of symbols and hats and things out here that I've lent to people. I'm never going to get those things. <laughs> it's here, dude. It's it's waiting just, for you, man. Just keep it for next time. Um, that gives me a, a, a reason to come over by the house again, man. Yeah, man. I appreciate it, buddy. I'm going to sign it. I'm going to pretend it's to you and sell it on eBay and see what I can get. Man. Just like Blair was here. <laughs> Like the Shawshank Redemption. Exactly. Yeah, man. So right. what's uh, what, what's the weather like today? Sunny and 70 there in Glendale, California? Or Dude, what? we actually had thunderstorms this morning. Ah, a little rain. Well, do you guys which good? Is, which never, it's like once a year happening. They woke me up at four in the morning. I thought there were planes taking off from Burbank Airport. Like, I was like, why the fuck are there airplanes taking off at four in the morning? And they got closer and closer. I was like, oh, it's thunder. So Yeah. yeah. Awesome, man. Well, I miss it. So kiss it for me. And, uh. Talk to you soon, man. All right, dude. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, pal. Take it easy.